out there, everybody. What's going on? This is Miho from the Too Close to Call series, and we got your dollar dogs here. Dollar hot dogs. I'm ready to play (laughs) today. today. Hey, Pags, not to be a bummer right now, but the recent Oduba Herrera, maybe you can play center field. Hey, that was a little shot at an inappropriate topic. Sure hey. was, wasn't it? So, baby. <laughs> Baseball's rolled it again. Basketball's about to be over. Hockey's about to be over. Football's on the back burner until about late July. So we got some heavy baseball talk right now. We are starting to get into June... All-star voting has just begun. There's the lurking July 31st trade deadline. And based on June 1st, man, that quarter pull, you kind of see where you're at now. You're starting to feel out the buyers, the sellers, the type of pieces these teams need. And we'll start right up here in the AL East. And we got the New York Yankees, even with all these injuries, still in first place, but only a game up on your Tampa Bay Rays, who... Nobody has any idea who plays for them. Is Evan Longoria still on the team? No, he's in San Francisco. I have no idea who the hell's on that team. Yeah, but, they uh, even had the Cy Young winner last year, and nobody right. still knows. <laughs> Charlie Morton, they signed from the Astros, too. There it is, ex-Phil. Hey, the Yankees righted the ship, even though they were decimated about having an all-star team on the IR is pretty unbelievable. And the fact that they're still one game up tells me all I need to know about the AL East, that it's going to be the Yankees. Do you see any potential struggles of these names coming back, even though they have the pedigree, Stanton, Judge, sometimes it takes a little bit to get back into the rhythm, and they're cruising now. Do you see any little speed bumps coming up for them, potentially? I'm sure there'll be a couple here and there. They're going to have a couple four-strikeout, three-strikeout games where people are going to get frustrated, but in the long run for them, they need those guys if they're going to make a long postseason run. I think they're going to be right there, obviously, when it comes to October. They were preseason favorites, and clearly with their bench, it's going to be strong when the starters yes. come back to play. But lurking down there a little bit, man. They've played better baseball, still really haven't hit that 2018 stride yet. But the Boston Red Sox at seven and a half games back, but two games over 500. You really can't count the reigning champs out, but this is kind of what... They're Boston right there in does. the wild card as I'm looking at it here, Pags. They are right, right in the mix of it. There's a handful you, of teams currently stuck together. And you know that the Rays, they're going to be playing the Sox a lot coming up. So the Sox control their own destiny just even getting back into the AL East race. The Red Sox seem to do this every year. They'll win one and then they'll become irrelevant for a year or two and then they'll come back and win another one. Just enough turnover on the roster to get that drive going again where your consistent people like Betts and everybody else just continues to deliver. But as I'm scrolling through the standings here, man, the surprise team of 2019, the surprise of the spring, the Minnesota Twins, 37-17. and That may be the best record in baseball. Yeah, I think the Dodgers are right there, too. What's your take on how the hell the Twins are putting this together? Talking about people I can't name, I can't name anybody on the Twins, either. Obviously, with Presley going from Minnesota down to Houston, I'm super pleased with the success he's had and Houston's had, but I did not see this coming with the Twins. They were basically sellers last year. The main move, I don't know how many beans I'm allowed to spill, but... Let's just say everybody was not a fan of Paul Molitor in the clubhouse and the way he ran things. And I believe it's Rocco Baldelli now, who you should remember the name, was very similar to Gabe Kapler. A lot of these managers are these bench pieces who play in a lot of different organizations because they're kind of taking in how everything's being run, being put together, because they're not worried about who's pitching tonight. I have five at-bats against them. It's I play... Every third day, I'm running the bases. So on these other days, let me take a look at this here. Okay, how is he talking to him? What position is he putting this person in? And they really get the ins and outs. And I think he's running that clubhouse to perfection. And not to mention Jose Barrios, their ace starter. He is so fun to watch, dude. That curveball, if you're a fan of Aaron Nola's curveball, watch Jose Barrios pitch. If you remember that one game against the Phils he threw, dude, it's like a wiffle ball up there. 
Yeah, it's unbelievable the way the arc on his thing. Did Rocco Baldelli play for the Rays when we were in the World Series with him? I don't know if he did in the World Series, but he was certainly on that team. So It was definitely then, because there's no way I would know his name if he didn't play <laughs> against the Bills. Well, that certainly <laughs> makes sense, man. But your Cleveland Indians, 28 and 27, they are flirting with seller status here. We may see Trevor Bauer, starting pitcher, hit the market. I would take him in a heartbeat. He's had plenty of playoff experience. And uh, he's obviously not very loved in Cleveland after all the berating tweets and texts and all kinds of shit he's been getting. There. That's the only thing, man. Around Major League Baseball, I will say his reputation is not to be the greatest dude, but hell of a pitcher. So always that risk reward, man. Professional teams have constantly weighed and as we shift to the AL West here, the previously mentioned Houston Astros, way in first place, man, seven and a half games up. So look at that, dude. In the AL, we have a nine and a half game lead, a seven and a half game lead, and outside of New York and Tampa, seven and a half. So are these divisions all but wrapped up here and it's not even June? It sure seems like it. And the highs and the lows of the AL is just unbelievable over there. The Angels still are struggling. It seems like these division winners, except for maybe the AL East, have it locked up. And then two wild cards out of the AL East, maybe the Indians, if they don't sell. It's like, what the hell is going on? Well, shout out to Ryan Presley, whose consecutive scoreless appearance streak came to an end at 40. First pitch home run by Jackie Bradley Jr. of the Red Sox brought that to an end. But an unbelievable streak. Him and Ozuna at the back end of the bullpen are the most lights out duo there is at the end of games. And yeah, man, and that interview he had with him was awesome. It was really cool to see his mindset and how he got to where he is, and it was a hell of a ride for him. Just a cool dude, man, willing to chat yeah. at 12, 12.30 in the morning with room service coming, and that was just the initial chat. I'm really looking forward to parts two and three where – the next part I'm going to dive into is minor league experiences and who he played with and the cities he played in and get some stories and oh, find out which ones he liked along the way, which cities suck, all that types of stuff. So tune into that. That's going to be coming at the end of next month, at the end of June. And I think that one's going to be a hell of a listen. You're going to have to tell the story about the old airport trip, too. <laughs> for sure, man, for sure. But as we transition to the National League, we go to the NL East, and we got the Philadelphia Phillies, who have currently extended their lead these past couple of days to three and a half over the Atlanta Braves, with the Mets and Nationals both currently under 500 and potentially already out of the race. I don't know. I just think I just love seeing the Mets and the Nats being out of it like the good old days. Have a nice little Phil's Braves battle for first place in the AL East. It's going to be great. It's going to be interesting to watch how those teams attack the trade deadline, as well as all of their managers seem to be firmly <laughs> on the hot seat. So stay tuned there. We could see some movement in the NL East in the coming months. How crazy is it that Gabe Kepler is the one in the NL East that's not on the hot seat? <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's amazing the – local perception compared to some of the national perception because some of my national friends within the baseball world they only see the box scores the standings the statistical things right they're not watching day in and day out so when i'll text oh my god i can't believe this goddamn bullpen they'll be like dude they have the second best era in the national league what are you talking about and i'm like no you don't understand you don't watch them and adam morgan just went down again dude they're just so beat up and that's where the conversation should be around gabe kapler potentially being a manager of the year candidate and everybody's just still around the oh when's he gonna fuck this up how long is it gonna take before Something happens with Gabe again, managing like it's Game 7 of the World Series. I feel like Gabe's kind of learned from his mistakes. He took some of the criticism that he had been getting for the past year, and I really do think that we are riding this uh, lineup, and pitching is just what it is, and we're dealing with it day in and day out. JT Rio Muto is becoming this team's version of Chase Utley. Yes. 
He just doesn't say a word, shows up, is one of the best players at his position. He's carrying the pitching staff that's currently in flux, and he deserves more credit than he's getting, in my opinion. For sure. I love watching him play. Dude, he, he is so good behind the dish and on the plate. It's great. As we transition to the NL Central, this is the tightest division in all of baseball with every team within six games. How about that? One of them up there was seven and a half, and this one's all within six. Currently with the Cubs and Brewers extending themselves a little bit from the pack. Yeah, the Cubs and Brewers, it kind of seems like those are the two top tier teams in the Central, and I just feel like this division's going to beat the shit out of each other. Like, everybody's just decent they're all going to play each other just hammer each other we kind of thought that's how the nl east was going to chalk up but it's sure looking like the nl central is becoming one of the best divisions in baseball and it's pretty amazing the fact that the phils have a great record against the teams in that division they've played them tough and the story there continues to be christian yelich his home run pace as well as just overall year he has a chance to have the first 60 home run season since 2001 when Bonds and Sosa both did it. I know there's a lot of games to play here, but he's got 21 through 55 games, which puts him on pace for 62. And Cody Bellinger right behind him with 20, so he's got to be right around that mark as well. What are your thoughts? Do you think we see that 60 mark for the first time in 18 years? If anybody can do it, it really seems to be this guy. He is just on another level with the way he swings. He's not a big guy. He's lanky as shit, and it feels like he just wallops the ball every time he gets a hold of it. Well, he's not the only one hitting home runs, man. League-wide, they are on an all-time record pace. Right now, the league is on pace to hit 6,484 home runs, which would shatter the record from 2017. It's not even close, man. And this game continues to evolve into a strikeout home run game. And what are your thoughts around that? Are you a fan of all these home runs and strikeouts? Or are you a put the ball in play type of fan? I'm not one way or the other. I'm kind of right there in the middle. I fucking love them. Oh, take a stand, Pags. I'm on the I, fence. I'm going I this I way. Don't really, I really don't care if I sit on the fence with this one because I'm like, I love watching home runs, but then I love watching Gene Segura plot one out the first and extend it into a double, and then I do get frustrated when fucking Bryce Harper strikes out four times, but then he crushes one, and then I love him again, so it's like, I don't really know how to feel about it. (laughs) That's the game, dude. It's strike out, strike out, it's okay, walk home run, two runs, man. You don't have to have as many hits as long as they're extra base hits. The game just continues to evolve that way, and Bellinger has continued his hot start after changing hitting coaches in the offseason to lead the Dodgers out to a eight-game lead as we turn to June above the Padres, Diamondbacks, and Rockies. That division, I think, is pretty much over. Yeah, the Dodgers have a hold on that. I'd be really interested to see how the Phils stack up against them tomorrow. Top two teams in the NL going against each other over the weekend. It should be fun to watch. I don't know if we're going to get Kershaw or anybody like that. Phillies Dodgers stay up late over the weekend. Check those out. And we have two quick tidbits to wrap up the dollar dog here. And that is who will sign Keuchel and Kimbrell. After the June 3rd draft, I believe it is, that's when these people will come off the market because the teams will no longer have to give up a draft pick because they just used it 24 hours earlier. So people think they're now open to one, maybe two-year deals. Do you see the Phils being interested? With the decimated bullpen, I would lean towards Kimberl rather than Keuchel. I would rather them go around with maybe a Bumgarner or a Bauer along those lines, but I could sure see them adding one of them. I could also see the Rays making a push to try to get one of these key guys and be like, hey, come on, we're making one run out of here. Come on down to Tampa where only 6,000 people will come watch you play. Yeah, what the hell is that all about? Where the hell are they going to go? Twitter wants them to go to Portland. Portland, interesting. But I was thinking more along the lines of staying in the AL East because of the old division thing. I probably would send them to, why don't we give North Carolina a baseball team? Put them in Charlotte. Charlotte, Nashville, 
plenty of places. Tampa, we've been down there. It's fucking dead down there. There's more Phillies fans in Tampa because they're right by Clearwater. <laughs> that is true. The last thing to close on here, Pags, and we started with a controversial topic. We're going to end with a controversial topic because apparently we're a controversial podcast. So oh. the hot topic is extending the nets to protect fans. There was an incident in the Houston Astros game where a guy had a line drive down the line. It struck a young girl who was then rushed to the hospital Reports are she's going to be okay, she's going to make it, but it always seems something like this is the straw that breaks the camel's back to extending the nets. The only concern I have is if you extend it down the foul lines, what's the difference between that foul ball the guy hit down the left field line and a line drive into the 10th row in left field for a home run? You see these stat cast things. These balls are being hit 100 to 110 miles an hour. So if we're going nets, do we have to go all the way around the entire field, even on the foul poles, go from foul pole to foul pole all the way up? Like, are we taking balls into the stands, that experience when you're a kid or giving them to a child completely away from the fan? I don't know. I I get the safety aspect, but I'm just... That's the old school part of my brain being like, nah, that's the coolest part, man, going to the game and getting the ball. Right, and I've never done it before, and I've always wanted to catch one, and it's never happened. I mean, we were at the Iron Pigs the other day, and you saw our wives. They couldn't freaking see the ball even though we were all the way up top. And it's like, how the hell don't you see that? This ball's right there. But it's tough, man, because foul balls come a whole lot quicker because they're just right off the bat, and it's a lot closer, where as a home run, you see it traveling across the field. You have time to uh, adapt to it. You can't put a net in the outfield. If you're going to do that, anything, maybe make an age requirement for the outfield. If you're concerned about little children, maybe put it at 12, 15 years old. You could sit in the outfield if that's the only place that's not going to be roped off, something like that. Kids only sections in the upper deck. I don't Which care if sucks. you have season tickets. If you got a little one, you're not allowed to use them. I completely understand the whole safety aspect. If my kid got hit by a foul ball, on the other side of it, you got to be a good parent and freaking see the ball and block it from your child. That's what it is. It's the quickness. And to your point, the home run gives you time. So it's that factor of, okay, what's in adequate amount of time as well as just all the distractions at games people on their phones if you look down for three seconds no matter where you are it could happen so there is some liability on the person but i do understand they have to protect them and i think it is a matter of time until we see nets all the way around in foul territory i just don't want the game to evolve to be literally engulfed in a net anywhere yeah, that, that a suck. fan could be involved just for safety purposes. I don't foresee it that way. I, I just think there's going to be some type of amendment where they extend the net or maybe put the age requirements at certain spots on the field. I don't know. It's tricky, man, and we'll see. But that was one that popped into the forefront this morning on Sports Center, and I'm sure everyone's going to be talking about. So we had to bring it up here because we're bringing you guys the news as journalists. For sure. And Because you're going to get those baseball fanatics like yourself that are like, you can't change the game that much. And it's in every sport people act like that. But at some point, your human aspect of it has to be like, okay, what if a girl dies by getting hit with a ball? How are you going to feel then? But it's a tricky subject. I'm sure it's not the last we're going to hear of this. As always, guys, we appreciate having you. This is the Dollar Dog Podcast, brought to you by Too Close to Call. Share us on all the social medias. We're out on all the podcast platforms, and we will talk to you guys next week with some more baseball news. Peace.